This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. Good morning, and thanks for joining us. You're listening to Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit on MTV Think Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Josie Bidwell, Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine and Nurse Practitioner at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Today, I'm going to go through some of the medical headlines that are out there. Headlines are often catchy, but they don't tell the full story. So I've dug down into some of those headlines that are out there and kind of help clear up any confusion or answer any questions related to those things. But if you have questions or comments for us, our number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 You can email us, fit at org, And that's not just during the show. You can email anytime, and we're happy to answer your question. Or you can go over to uh, Facebook to Healthy Habits with Josie, and you can drop me a message or a direct message there, and I'm happy to answer your questions in any of those ways. For the first uh, little bit, we're going to spend talking about actually two headlines that came out this past week looking at sleep. And both of them are looking at ways to get good quality sleep. And before we really get into the the meat of those stories per se, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about why sleep is so important. We've done some uh, sleep-focused shows on here before, uh, but I can't, I can't reinforce enough how important sleep is to overall health. We try and focus on this show and staying healthy and fit and preventing um, disease when we can, disease and disability, and sleep is a humongous part of that. When we don't sleep well, and when we say sleep well, I mean sleep for the appropriate number of hours or the and the appropriate quality so that that sleep is restful, it has a trickle-down effect throughout our body in multiple different ways. Um, if it just happens kind of one time, then we usually just feel fatigued the next day, and we may may not function at uh, you know our top uh, top level of performance. But if it continues over time, one of the most dangerous things is that we stop realizing that we're not functioning at our our top level of performance, and uh, we think we're doing just fine when in reality our reaction time is slowed our um, ability to make uh, critical thinking decisions is slowed, uh, and our cravings for different things go up. And so I I work with a lot of patients and a lot of folks on improving heart health, weight loss, those types of things. And if we don't address sleep, uh, then we're not going to kind of get the biggest bang for our buck, so to speak, in any other any of the other lifestyle factors that can can play into those. Um, In particular, heart health, when we don't sleep well, it does put extra strain on our heart uh, and tends to make our blood pressure higher than we would like for it to be. Um, If we've got sleep apnea, it can actually increase our risk um, for things like heart attacks and strokes. Uh, And so we really want to invest and look at our sleep. So I mentioned quality and quantity. So how much should we be getting for adults? And that's what I'll focus on today. um, It's about seven to nine hours. So less than seven hours and more than nine hours. Both of those are kind of associated with um, poor health outcomes. So we don't want to sleep too little, but we also don't want to sleep too much. And so I usually ask folks, what time do you get in the bed? What time do you, you know, how long does it take you to fall asleep? And what time do you wake up in the morning? And then any nighttime awakenings in there so that we can see how many hours we're getting. Uh, Then we need to think about how rested we actually feel when we get up. So do we feel like we slept well? We've got energy. And I don't mean the the second your eyeballs open. Everybody's a little groggy uh, the second your eyeballs open. But um, you know, as you get up and start to move throughout your morning, 
you know, do you feel rested, um, like you're ready to face the day, or do you feel like you're kind of dragging and not uh, and don't have the energy that you need to go about your daily tasks? And that can happen from a variety of reasons, right? If you're only sleeping three or four hours a night, I wouldn't expect for you to be super rested in the morning. But if you're sleeping eight hours or what you think is eight hours and you're not rested in the morning, then that would prompt us to look a little bit further into maybe what is going on during the sleep, right? Maybe restless leg is keeping you from um, getting, getting into the deeper stages of sleep that you need to. Perhaps you do have sleep apnea, those types of things. So it, it warrants uh, further evaluation there. And that's kind of what leads us to, to these two stories that came out this week. One is related to food and sleep. And the other is related to light and sleep. And these are two very, very important things that we've uh, always kind of talked about in terms of sleep, but this gives us a little bit more information. We'll start with the food one. Usually when we think about food in relationship to sleep, we think about caffeine and trying to cut back on caffeine in the latter parts of the day um, so that we can fall asleep easier. And that is an important strategy if you uh, have trouble falling asleep at night. Caffeine sticks around in your system for a very long time. And unfortunately, what happens is folks will get, uh, if they're not sleeping well, they get kind of sluggish in the afternoons. And so we reach for a coffee or a tea or a soda that has caffeine in it to try and push through the rest of the day. And that just further kind of impedes our ability to go to sleep at night and we kind of get stuck in this cycle. So caffeine is one that's kind of been readily out there. Um, alcohol is another one that uh, is more uh, talked about in terms of the disruption in the sleep cycle. But salt is not one that we often talk about much. Right? Uh, in the past, we have kind of acknowledged the relationship between high salt foods and high blood pressure. And we do know that if you have kind of a, a higher blood pressure at bedtime, it can make you not be able to fall asleep as easily. But this study um, or this headline that came out was salty foods right before bed may disrupt sleep. And what they actually looked at, and it's important to, to realize that this is, um, you know, not a huge study and still looking at more in the, in the animal models, but... Um, a high salt meal before bed actually increased um, uh, kind of the, the neuron firing and made us less likely to be able to fall asleep. And that's really important when we think about how much salt we consume in the American diet. So the average American consumes somewhere around 3,400 milligrams of sodium uh, in a day. And that is well above the recommended intake of 2,300 milligrams. And I know that kind of milligram term can seem kind of foreign and nebulous out there. Like, what is that? 2,300 milligrams is about a teaspoon. Um, and so this is, uh, you know, not quite double that, but about one and a half times that is what we normally take in. Uh, and the majority of that comes from packaged products, not necessarily from the salt shaker. So starting with seasoning mixes or um, uh, soups and broths and um, gravy mixes and frozen meals and frozen products, a lot of those have extra salt added to them to keep them kind of shelf stable and prolong the flavor profile of those. And so if we're looking for ways to cut back on salt in our diet. Um, one of the kind of easiest ways or, or uh, the biggest bang for your buck is looking at pulling back on some of those packaged products that we have in our diet to help um, to help that there. Um, I've, over on um, Healthy Habits with Josie, I've got uh, some salt-free uh, seasoning mixes on there, like recipes for those. That's uh, one way that we get a little less salt in our diet. But if we're looking at improving our sleep, we absolutely want to look at avoiding a really high salt meal within about three hours of bedtime. I would usually say um, that we want to avoid any kind of big heavy meal within about uh, three hours of bedtime, one for the sleep and two for uh, weight loss, right? If we eat the brunt of our calories at the end of the day, 
um, then we tend to not burn through those as well. And we tend to gain a little bit more weight or at least not lose weight as we would um, anticipate and hope. Uh, so kind of thinking about when you need to be in the bed and backing meal time up as much as you can. And I know the real world exists and, you know, it's not always perfect and you get home from work late or the kids have things going on. Um, so it's not about perfection. It's just about kind of intentionality and trying to, to look at your schedule and plan things. Think about things you can put in, in the crock pot um, or things that you can batch cook on the weekend so that you're able to get a nutritious lower in salt uh, meal on the table within, uh, you know, within the time frame that's not going to uh, make it harder for you to go to sleep at night. I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine and Nurse Practitioner at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Thanks for listening to the Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit Podcast. If you have a question, you can email fit at mpbonline.org or leave a comment on my Facebook page, Healthy Habits with Josie. For ongoing information on staying healthy and fit, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. Hey, this is Larry Morrissey with the Mississippi Arts Commission. I'm one of the hosts of the Mississippi Arts Hour, the arts interview show on Think Radio. We talk with visual artists, musicians, writers, as well as people who help bring the arts to their communities. We hear about how each artist learned their craft and get some insight into their creative process. You can hear the Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 p.m. on Think Radio, or listen anytime by subscribing to the show through your favorite podcasting app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. for tuning in today. You are listening to Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit on MPB Think Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Josie Bidwell, nurse practitioner at UMMC. And we are going through some medical headlines today. And we've spent the first part of the show talking about sleep and sleep health. And we're taking your questions as well. Our number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 Six, four. Josie, you this always- is Liz. I'm uh, stepping in for Kevin today, and we. <laughs> I, what, I'm sorry, I interrupted that email. That's fine. But uh, I wanted to let yeah. you know that we do have a caller. It's Clydeen from Jackson. Good morning, Clydeen. How can we help you? Good morning. I have been diagnosed with sleep apnea in June of 2014, and my trouble is I have trouble staying asleep. I wake up maybe after the usual uh, four to five hours. Uh, sleep because um, that's what that's what they require. Use the machine that long, but mm-hmm. since my machine has been recalled, I can't use it. And believe me, right. I feel so much better not using it. But I still oh. wake up after five hours. Mm-hmm. I'm wide awake no matter how late I go to bed. And I, I was told by my doctor to go to bed, to start going to bed by eight o'clock, which I really have not been able to do. Right. I've not been doing that. Right. What time are you able to go to bed? Uh, basically, it's around 10 o'clock. Okay. And how long does it take you to fall asleep? Not long. My husband says I can okay. go to okay. sleep very quickly. So, that's good. So, that, you know, that's a whole different different set of stuff when we start thinking about people who have trouble falling asleep, but you've got trouble staying asleep. So yeah. you mentioned your machine was on recall, and that's an important thing for, for listeners to know. Um, Philips and, and Respironics. Uh, does have a recall on some of the CPAP machines. So if you have a CPAP machine, you can go on the Philips website and put the the serial number and things in there. It'll tell you if your machine's on recall or not. Um, And what is going on is some of the kind of the the foam particles that create the seal um, were a little loose in in some some machines. So that's why those are on recall. So um, let's talk about how you sleep. Do you sleep on your back? Or your side or your belly or are you a tornado? Uh, basically my back and I will tend to turn to my right side a lot. I have a terrible right shoulder with arthritis but okay. I, I, I like to sleep on, on the right side and I will turn to the left but I can't sleep as long on the left as I do uh, my right and my back. Okay. And how many pillows do you sleep on? Uh, one small one. I just need something on the curve of my neck uh, yes. and I tend to flip my pillow because it, you know, it gets flatter as you lay on it and you flip yes. around for the yes. Fuller side. 
So what I actually recommend for my patients that have sleep apnea and they either don't have sleep apnea that's severe enough to warrant a CPAP or their CPAP is on recall right now is uh, a wedge pillow, especially for my folks who are back sleepers or side sleepers. And so it looks like a wedge of cheese. So it has a little narrow end. It's a triangle. It has a little narrow end and then a, a wider end. And the narrow end goes underneath um, our back and shoulders mm-hmm. so that it elevates your the top part of your body. Because what's okay. happening with sleep apnea is kind of gravity is pressing down on those tissues in our neck and our airway and kind of making them flop closed a little bit. And so decreasing kind of the gravitational pull on our neck area helps alleviate some of that pressure. And so the wedge pillow will help with that. For folks who are are belly sleepers or tornado sleepers, they just kind of roll all around in the bed, um, I usually recommend bed risers. So they actually are little little blocks that go under the the feet of the head of the bed to actually elevate the whole bed up a Mm -hmm. little bit. But both of those things usually help with uh, sleep apnea. They also help with reflux if you've got any indigestion type issues there. Um, Pretty inexpensive uh, wedge pillows. You can get them for about 20 bucks at Walmart. uh, Or you can order them off of Amazon or Bed Bath & Beyond or any of those kinds of places there. But that's kind of been uh, my recommendation for folks who are not able to use the CPAP. Okay, thank you so very much. And again, I say I feel much more rested without the CPAP, though. And I'm not feeling uh, as much as I used yeah. to. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, also discuss that with your with your sleep medicine specialist, right? Because it could be that a different mask would be better for you um, or that the pressure is, is too high in yeah, your I'll machine. Use the, nasal, and the nasal mask is all I use. The, the nasal mask, mask. yeah. Right. You do the pillows or the actual low. mask? It's the little, the little pillows. The little pillows. Okay. That's about the least restrictive um, <laughs> yes. type of device that there is. Because <laughs> they get they get so hot on your face. Even that gets yeah. right. the the strap yeah. gets warm on my face, and I can't I get too warm. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, give this wedge pillow a try, and hopefully that'll help you stay asleep a little bit better. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Thank you for giving us a call. Guys, if you have a question out there, we're happy to take those today. Our number is one eight seven seven MPB ring, and that email was fit at mpbonline dot org. All right, kind of continuing our sleep discussion. Um, the second article that I wanted us to to touch on today was um, the role of light in sleep, and this headline caught my attention. Uh, Because it says energy-saving light bulbs can interfere with sleep. And so, ooh, I thought, oh, gosh, Uh, you know, all of our lights in our house are are the the kind of the LED energy-saving light bulbs. And so what is going on? Well, first, let's talk about what the impact of light is on sleep. So we have um, a spot in in our brain um, called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. It's a big old long word. You often see it abbreviated SCN. And it receives signals from the retina about how much light is available in our environment around us. And in particular, it is sensitive to blue light. So it's a different wavelength of light that is more prevalent during the daytime hours. And so when our... um, brain receives those signals that there is a lot of light and in particular blue light around it makes our brain release different chemicals that say hey it's awake time like I'm supposed to be awake right now I'm not supposed to be sleeping when it gets less input from those lights it in turn tells you uh, that it's starting to get to be sleepy time and so it's time for us to wind down and go to sleep so before we were inundated with electronics everywhere, right? We had a pretty uh, regulated sleep-wake cycle. We were awake and active during uh, the daylight hours, and as the sun goes down and our day comes to a close, we would go to bed. But there's light everywhere now, um, inside our homes, inside our office buildings, um, all the time. And it makes it a little bit difficult for our brain to just shut off and go to sleep. So this kind of plays into that uh, people who have trouble falling asleep. Um, It's often because of the amount of light that we are exposing ourselves to, or that's a contributing factor with some of it. In particular, screen time, iPads, cell phones, laptops, TVs, 
um, emit more of that blue light that sends that extra special signal that says, hey, I shouldn't go to sleep right now. I'm supposed to be awake. And apparently these uh, LED bulbs emit a little bit more of that as well. What this study was actually looking at was a almost a violet filter that goes on these lights that can kind of block some of that blue light. Um, but those are not commercially available yet. So my tip for that and what I tell my, um, my patients and, and folks that are I'm working with on sleep is if you have a dimmer switch in your house, as the sun starts to go down, start to dim down some of those lights as well. If you don't have a dimmer switch, then maybe cut off the big overhead lights uh, and do more um, uh, kind of can lights or lamps or soft lighting that way. And then think about what time you want your screens, what time your screens need to go off for you to be able to fall asleep more easily. And so if, you know, 10 o'clock is when you need to go to sleep to get your seven hours of rest, then about 9 to 9.30 is when those screens need to go away um, and swap out for, you know, a different activity to help you fall asleep. Maybe it is uh, drawing or doodling. Maybe it's journaling. Maybe it's reading in a book or a crossword puzzle or something that's relaxing. Also, if you wake up in the middle of the night, don't reach for that cell phone or tablet or TV or those types of things because that exposure to that that blue light right then is going to say, hey, it's wake up time. Go ahead and, and wake up. And so you'll have difficulty falling back asleep. Um, and so those are just really important tips when you're looking at how do we fall asleep and stay asleep well. I did have a question that came in through uh, Facebook this morning that said, um, it's actually a follow-up to the question about food and sleep. Um, it says that their husband really like late snacks. And so what, you know, should they cut out snacks in general or what could you eat um, if you needed a late night snack? And so there are definitely some people that uh, we're going to recommend to have late night snacks, in particular folks that have diabetes that may have low blood sugars in the morning, sometimes we'll advise an, an evening snack with that, those kinds of things. And the good news is there are actually some foods that help us with sleep. Um, you may be familiar with the word melatonin. Um, that is kind of a, a buzzword when it comes to sleep. You can buy melatonin supplements um, at the store, and a lot of people use those to help with sleep. Melatonin is, when we're doing all these other things, and I say it helps us fall asleep, it's because it helps us release our, uh, our melatonin and use it appropriately. Um, so things like pistachios are an actual um, source, natural source of melatonin. Heart cherries as well are another source of melatonin. So some folks you will see do a couple of ounces of tart cherry juice at bedtime to help with sleep. Um, uh, dairy can be uh, helpful in sleep onset. That's why you often see the um, warm milk for, for bedtime. And then also a, a whole grain like an oatmeal. Those are all foods that can help us uh, fall asleep. So one of the things that I actually talk to my patients about is, you know, if you normally have a bowl of cereal or a bowl of ice cream, which tend to be two very, very common things um, at, at, at late night, uh, swap that out for maybe a Greek yogurt and some frozen uh, tart cherries in there and see if that doesn't kind of calm down that sweet craving that you were looking for as well as help you fall asleep a little bit easier. I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine and Nurse Practitioner at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Thanks for listening to the Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit Podcast. If you have a question, you can email fit at mpbonline.org or leave a comment on my Facebook page, Healthy Habits with Josie. For ongoing information on staying healthy and fit, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. Hello, I'm Dr. Nancy Lotridge anderson president of New Perspectives, a fee-only financial advising firm and co-host of Money Talks. For over 10 years, Money Talks has been answering your personal financial questions and sharing knowledge about money management. Money Talks can be heard Tuesdays at 9 a.m. on MPB Think Radio. Podcasts can be found on our website, money.mpbonline.org 
or on your smart device's podcasting platform. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Joining us today on Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, and we've been talking through some of the medical headlines that are out there, and we've had a lot of great conversation around sleep and how to fall asleep easier, stay asleep, and get the appropriate amount of good quality rest. If you have a question or a comment for us, our number is one eight seven seven mpb ring one 672 7464 I uh, did have a question that came in actually about taking a fiber supplement before bed. So they say, I take my daily Metamucil before bed. Is this a good idea? And so um, I think that it's important to think about, is that the time you're going to remember to take it, right? Because medicines don't work unless we take them when, you know, unless we take them. So whenever it's easiest for you to remember to take them um, is, is a good time. I will say um, that it's really, really important when you're taking a fiber supplement like that, in particular a fiber supplement that you have to um, dissolve in, in a liquid, that you take the full amount of liquid that uh, is called for. I believe with Metamucil, it's eight ounces or about 240 milliliters of water in there. Um, if you don't take enough liquid in there, it can actually make that stuff thicken up a little bit more and kind of get uh, get a little hard to pass through the esophagus and then it'll kind of swell and you'll have some discomfort there. If you have um, reflux or indigestion, then also adding this in right before bed uh, might not be the best idea there. Also, if you find yourself waking up to, to urinate multiple times in the night, drinking that eight ounce glass of water right before bed may not be the, the best thing as well. So it's not kind of a direct contraindication or anything, uh, but just some uh, kind of cautions that I would put in there uh, when, when doing that. Uh, a lot of times people will do these kind of before a meal because uh, it kind of makes you feel a little bit fuller uh, so that you tend to take in less calories. But, uh, you know, always check with your regular healthcare provider to make sure there's not any particular contraindication to you doing something or that that timing is, uh, is okay. For you there. All right. The next headline that we have is actually really important for us to talk about in light of what month this is, right? So it's October, it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, and it's also the time when a lot of folks are getting their COVID vaccines as well as their COVID boosters. And this headline has to do with swollen lymph nodes after a COVID vaccine, uh, and is that a thing? And are there anything that we need to to kind of be on the lookout for? And so, the big fancy word for swollen lymph nodes is lymphadenopathy. Um, and yes, it is a thing, but it is a thing with uh, not just COVID vaccines. Any other vaccines can cause swollen lymph nodes. Um, it's actually kind of expected, uh, so to speak, a little bit because uh, your immune system is being activated. The lymph nodes are part of that immune system. And so sometimes after a vaccine, you will see some swelling of the lymph nodes. Now, the lymph nodes that swell are usually on the same side as the vaccine. So if you've got the vaccine in your right arm, then the lymph nodes either under your right armpit or in your neck on the right side or even right above your collarbone are not necessarily unexpected. Um, I give lots and lots of COVID vaccines uh, in my role in preventive medicine, and I have seen this uh, happen with some folks. They usually come in just saying that they have soreness under their arm or um, in their neck area, and when we start to feel around, we can actually feel some of those, um, feel some of those lymph nodes there. Uh, it can be scary because lymph nodes in those areas often um, are associated with things like breast cancer because the lymph nodes right above your collarbone and in your armpit are the ones that kind of uh, drain the chest area. And so when we see lymph nodes in that particular area, uh, it can make us be a little bit more concerned about uh, a cancer in the chest. And so when these first started, when we first started seeing more and more reports of these, people were were much more concerned 
but then we realized that it was uh, related more to the COVID vaccine. And you can have these lymph nodes after flu vaccines, you know, uh, uh, I think the Tdap, the tetanus vaccine as well, um, tends to cause this a little bit more uh, as well. And so the, the take home kind of message with this is if you've had a vaccine and you feel, um, you know, a lump in your armpit, above your collarbone, in your neck, those kinds of things, absolutely still see your healthcare provider so that we can feel it. Um, probably do a breast exam as well. Those different types of things to make sure that we feel like it's vaccine related. And then kind of just some careful, uh, careful watching on that usually resolves itself in about three to seven days, um, occasionally a little bit longer than a week. Um, but the discomfort or the tenderness starts to go away as well as the swelling um, in a couple of days. If it's really uncomfortable for you, you can do um, kind of some warm compresses. So like a, a washcloth that you run under warm water or a warm water bottle, those types of things. Uh, in that area as well as Tylenol or ibuprofen to try and, you know, decrease the pain, decrease the inflammation. So it's usually a pretty self-limited condition. The thing we do need to be aware of and the thing that you need to tell your healthcare provider about is if you're going in for a mammogram. And you absolutely should be going in for your um, mammograms based off of your age, your risk, and how frequently your healthcare provider has said you need to do that. But if you've recently had the COVID vaccine or the flu vaccine, it's a good idea to tell them, right? Because when they do that mammogram, they may see those swollen nodes. Even nodes that you may not be able to feel, they may see them on that image. And so if we... if there's been no vaccine, then they're going to be a little bit more concerned about that area and start to, to do additional testing. Um, if you've recently had the vaccine, then they may wait just a little bit and, and repeat that. So it's really, really important that you have that conversation with your healthcare provider that you've had, um, had the vaccine. If you've not yet had your vaccine and it's time for your mammogram, just go ahead and get your mammogram, and then go get your vaccine. Just make a day of it, uh, and then you won't have to worry about that particular um, particular concern there. All right. If you have a question or a comment for us, our number is one eight seven seven MPB ring. Our email is fit at mpbonline dot org. And uh, you can go over to Facebook to Healthy Habits with Josie, and you can uh, drop me a message there. This next headline, uh, it kind of almost seems like duh, but it's important to talk about. So it says the primary goal in type 2 diabetes should be weight loss. And so why wouldn't it be was kind of my initial first read of that. But when you step back and you think, really the primary goal when we're managing diabetes has long been focused on just glycemic control, right? Getting control of the blood sugar so that we don't have too high of a blood sugar and then all of the complications that often occur um, from having too high of a blood sugar. And that's usually achieved with a variety of things, usually some oral medications, if we're talking type 2, some oral medications, um, some injectable medications, insulin, those kinds of things. As a lifestyle medicine provider uh, and preventive medicine provider, I also tend to focus on uh, the weight loss piece of it. And this article really reinforced that. What was not kind of a consensus in the article is how much weight loss we need to be looking at, um, with one expert saying about 15% of the total body weight. That's a, a kind of a, a big number and can seem really daunting to folks, especially if they've struggled with weight loss in the past. Uh, I mean, let's think if you're, if you weigh 200 pounds, uh, then 10% of that is 20, another 5% is 10. So it's only a 30 pound loss there. And that can be um, a little bit discouraging when you first start to think about it. So what I like to, to work with folks on is setting smaller, realistic goals. And once we achieve that goal, we set another one. So we do know that regardless of of um, kind of stopping diabetes or putting it in remission or reversing it, that weight loss of about 5 to 7% ha 
has been shown to give us good benefits in heart health. And that's why I was really excited about this particular article, because we don't want to focus on just controlling the blood sugar numbers with medicines. We want to kind of attack the underlying cause of a lot of these things, which is usually some type of metabolic syndrome um, or other metabolic uh, thing. Because if we have to think about the lifestyle that could have contributed to the development of type 2 diabetes. If we don't address that, that lifestyle, then even if we get good control of uh, our blood sugar, we may still have problems with high blood pressure, high cholesterol, or, or these other kind of related disorders in there. So we really want to focus on what we're eating and how much we're moving and our stress levels and our sleep, which we already spent a really, uh, really good amount of time talking about today. And so really setting that uh, achievable goal of about 5 to 7% of your total body weight is just a really important first step. The second part that I think people get a little confused on is how quickly that weight loss should occur. And that's not our fault. Like that's not anybody's fault because all we are, all we see in, on television and in print and on social media is, drop 20 pounds in 20 days or some other really quick weight loss um, uh, idea out there or different, you know, different diet or supplement or any of these different kinds of things. And usually those work on a, uh, on the premise of restriction. And so they uh, drastically cut back your calories or your food groups or any of these kinds of things. And so you may lose that amount of weight very, very quickly. But you usually will find it again, and it will bring some of its some of its friends along with it uh, because you really uh, didn't do it in a long lasting sustainable way okay um, so that sustainable way is about one to two pounds per week uh, so to lose that you know five to ten percent of your total body weight or five to seven percent of your total body weight may take you a little while, and that's okay. Slow and steady wins the race there. I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine and Nurse Practitioner at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Thanks for listening to the Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit Podcast. If you have a question, you can email fit at mpbonline.org or leave a comment on my Facebook page, Healthy Habits with Josie. For ongoing information on staying healthy and fit, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. Southern Remedies, Relatively Speaking, is a show that explores issues that relate to you and your family. To find out what we're all about, subscribe to the podcast by using any podcast app or by downloading our MPB Public Media app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. for joining us today on Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit. I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, and we've been going through some medical headlines. We've spent a lot of time talking about sleep today, and we're happy to continue doing that. Our number is one eight seven seven mpb ring We are in the last segment of the show, so if you have a question that you want us to answer and discuss on the air, now's the time to do so. Before the break, we were talking about um, focusing on weight loss in addition to control of blood sugar when we're dealing with uh, type 2 diabetes. And we did have a question that came in through Facebook that said, well, what's the best diet then for weight loss? And, man, that's a lot to unpack in the last segment of the show. And so we've done some some additional shows on diet. I plan to do one uh, next week as well in building a sustainable diet. But the the big thing to think about is that no diet is one size fits all. And if you've listened to me before, you know, I generally don't like the word diet because it has a negative kind of connotation to it, that it's something we're going to start and something we're going to stop when we really, we just want to adopt a way of eating or an eating pattern or a nutrition uh, pattern that supports our health goals, right? Whatever we want for ourselves, whether that be weight loss, 
control of cholesterol, control of blood sugar, control of blood pressure, um, or our weight maintenance if we're just trying to kind of maintain our current weight. And so the best eating plan is the one that you will stick with. Um, you know, I'm a big proponent of plant-based and plant-predominant um, ways of eating, and I, I still think that is a viable solution for the vast majority of people. But it is uh, when you're adopting a way of eating, it is, has to be one that you can afford, have access to, and enjoy. Because the reason that diets fail is they are restrictive, and they paint food in negative ways in that you can't have this or it's bad if you eat this or you in fact are bad if you eat this. I can't tell you how many people that I speak with on a daily basis or that I see in my clinic that um, as soon as the visit starts, they say, you're going to be mad at me or I was bad. And neither one of those things are true. Okay? I'm never going to be mad at someone for eating food. Uh, and I am never, and you're never bad um, based off of the food that you eat. There's just food that we need to eat more of, food that we need to eat less of. If those are important to us and important for managing or preventing whatever uh, chronic disease we are trying to, to work on. So um, I like to throw those kind of negative words right out the window, right? So in terms of uh, a way of eating that you can do, it has to do with budget and access and all of these different kinds of things in there. But one of the, the best ways to be full, right, which is important, uh, diets also tend to starve us, uh, which is not sustainable. One of the best ways to be full is to eat more plant foods because plants have just more, um, uh, more volume for less calories, and so you're able to eat uh, until you're full. All right, we're going to go to Mobile and talk with Mikey this morning. Good morning, Mikey. What can we do for you? I just got to add to your commentary, Doc, um, mm-hmm. uh, which is uh, you know not that it's going to be anywhere near as brilliant as most of yours is, and I'm so grateful for everything that you've taught me. Um, but uh, this is kind of a short way that I think about it because, you know, Simple, yeah, works for me. Mm-hmm. The, and the word diet, die, is the first uh, part, right? Mm-hmm. I prefer the et part, okay? <laughs> I like to eat. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> I like to eat, too. Uh, food is one of my greatest pleasures, um, but it's still just food, right? You know, and so having a right. good, healthy relationship with it is really important. Like I said, die is the first thing. You don't want to overdo the die part, right? Right. And there's actually a really great book out there called How Not to Die uh, by Dr. Michael Greger. And it is a look at plant-based nutrition and how it can help improve a lot of the chronic illnesses that we have going on today. Okay, I'm sorry. The last name of that doctor, Michael? Greger. 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 Thank you, Mo. You're welcome. You're welcome. (laughs) Bye-bye. Have a good day. And uh, Dr. Greger is a fellow in the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and he has a follow-up book called How Not to Diet. And so, of course, I'm not, uh, I don't get any benefit from recommending those books. They're just two uh, two of the books that I enjoy on my shelf um, to to reach for when I'm looking for uh, tips for plant-based ways of eating. So when we think about that plant-based or plant-predominant dietary pattern, that can seem very daunting to folks because they automatically associate that with the word vegan um, or vegetarian. And that is not necessarily the case. Um, I often consider myself the world's okayest vegan because I would probably get kicked out of the vegan club um, sometimes because I don't, I'm, I don't get too stressed out, especially when I'm eating out. If something maybe was made with chicken broth or it had a little bit of, um, you know, a little bit of dairy in it, those kinds of things. Because what I'm trying to focus on is that the majority of the foods on my plate are from plants. And the quickest way to do that is to divide your plate in half and then divide one half of it into other halves. So you've got a half of a plate and two quarters of a plate. And that big half a plate should be fruits and veggies. And if we start building our plate that way, 
then we automatically are increasing the amount of um, plant-based foods that we're getting in our diet because the way we normally build our plates here in um, America are the meat uh, on that big side of the plate uh, and a little bitty tiny serving of um, vegetables. All right, we have a caller on the line, so I want to get to him very, very quickly. Daniel, we're running out of time, so go ahead and drop your question for me. Yes. Um, how do you feel about virgin uh, coconut oil? Because I know that I usually feel good about it. How do you feel about using it <laughs> to cook with and use it? So, and I love your show. Oh, well, thank you so much for listening. So I'll try and answer this um, pretty quick. Um, added oils in general, I try and stay away from, whether they're an unsaturated oil like an olive oil, avocado oil, or whether they're more saturated like a coconut oil, just because I, I'm watching my cholesterol. And then also in terms of weight management, adding an oil is only adding calories and fat. It's not really adding anything that's going to fill up my belly. So I would rather add coconut to something or avocado to something or olives to something and get those healthy fats that way. But at the end of the day, you shouldn't be using enough kind of added oils that it really makes a difference, whether it's coconut oil or olive oil or any of these other kinds of things. We need to be kind of limiting our added oils to about one to two tablespoons um, a day, shying on the smaller end of that actually with the, the one tablespoon because Every tablespoon of oil, regardless of whether it's olive oil or coconut oil, is a 14 grams of fat and 120 calories. And so that can very, very, very quickly add up uh, and sabotage your weight loss um, efforts if that is what you're trying to achieve with that. But that was a great question. Next week on the show, we're really going to dive into how we build that sustainable way of eating that leaves us full and satisfied and that we don't feel restricted um, in doing. I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine and Nurse Practitioner at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Thanks for listening to the Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit Podcast. If you have a question, you can email fit at mpbonline.org or leave a comment on my Facebook page, Healthy Habits with Josie. For ongoing information on staying healthy and fit, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. Thanks for listening to this MPB Think Radio podcast. MPB depends on support from listeners, so if you can, please contribute today at mpbonline.org. Join us each week for Everyday Tech on MPB Think Radio. We have an IT expert, a computer repair ace, and we troubleshoot your problems on the phones as well. Everyday Tech, Wednesdays at 10 on MPB Think Radio.